Good evening, everybody. Um, well, I'd like to give you offer you a very warm welcome to tonight's webinar, which is being hosted by HCC Habiki Cymru, and it's all about innovative technology to support the sheep sector. We've got two sessions for tonight, um, and uh, we will start off with our first first section. But before we do that, uh, just a couple of um, housekeeping things to to bear in mind. Uh, you will have read the um, while you were in the waiting room, but just to reiterate, if you'd like to ask a question, you just need to click on the little orange arrow, the white arrow in the orange box, and that, and then expand it, and then you'll be able to type your question in there. And then what we will do is is t deal with your questions after our first two speakers have have finished speaking. Um, but please do feel free to, um, to to put any questions that you that you may have, um, and we'll deal with them in the formal question period. Um, the webinar should last, um, the, the total webinar should finish at around nine o'clock and it will be recorded and published on the HEC and the AHDB websites and you will receive a copy within 24 hours um, if you've signed up for this webinar. So um, just going on to, to the, the um, webinar, it's, uh, the first session itself, um, which is adding value to the hill flock. We've got two excellent speakers um, who will be will be addressing this. We have Janet Roden from Innovis and one of our leader flock uh, farmers, Earwell Jones, who will be talking about his experience as part of the Hill Ram scheme. I should have said, my name's um, Heather McAlman. I work um, at HCC in the Red Meat Development Program as a project coordinate, program coordinator, and I'm taking a lead on the Hill Ram scheme. And it's um, we're really delighted to have the opportunity to share with you um, all about the, the progress that we've been making with the Hill Ram scheme. I believe a couple of years ago it was featured at the Sheep Breeders Roundtable, and it's it's great to have a chance to to give you an update on on how well it is progressing. So, with no further ado, I'm going to introduce um, Janet. Janet Rodens is probably very well known to many of you, as she's been working in the sheep genetics um, for many years since graduating um, with animal breeding genetics degrees. She's supported the pig and sheep breeding research at Y College before heading north to become a lecturer in agriculture at Aberdeen University. But during this time, she completed her PhD on the structure of nuclear sheep breeding programs. And then she returned to go home, help her family farm in Herefordshire before returning back to genetics full time. She now, as we, as we all know, probably wears a number of hats overseeing Innovis breeding programs, lecturing in animal genetics at Harper Adams, and acting as an independent consultant. And she's obviously an invaluable delivery partner to the Hill Ram scheme. And with no further ado, I will hand over to Janet. Thank you very much, Heather, for that um, kind introduction. Um, so yes, I really want to update everyone a little bit about the Hill Ram scheme, um, but start off a little bit with just why um, improving the genetics of hill sheep is just so important, not only for hill farmers, but for our whole industry. So recently published, we've had an update of the sheep breed survey, which hopefully many of you contributed to. Um, and it shows quite clearly the importance of hill breeds in terms of our overall industry. So 18.2 of the British lamb crop are coming from pure hill ewes, and a further 27.2 are from hill cross ewes. So they're having a massive genetic impact on our entire industry and as much as 26% of the ewes in Britain are the hill breeds. That's down on previous breed surveys, and there's a natty little headline in there, something like the decline of the hill flock. But I think we all recognise that although it has declined um, in recent years, it will still be and will continue to be a really, really important part of the industry. Next slide, please. And this is exactly why hill sheep are always going to be important to us. Again, data that will be very familiar to you, but a very high proportion of the British Isles are less favoured areas in hill country, which the hill breeds are the best breeds adapted to graze much of that area. So we're always going to need our hill breeds and they're always going to be important in supplying genetics further down the chain in our industry. Next, please. Um, so when we think about adding value to the hill flock, um, let's think a little bit about how much scope there is for adding value. And I've got some data here which comes from a really, really nice um, report that was funded by the levy bodies um, and was published last year. 
and it um, paired beef and sheep farms in less favoured areas in terms of the type of farm, the topography, geographical region. So it paired them up and looked at the differences between the top performers and the bottom performers that were similar in all other characteristics of their farm, just to see what a difference it would make. Um, and there were some really stunning headline figures from that. And one that caught my eye was that um, for Wales, the difference in income from LFA grazing livestock farms of similar size, similar type, similar topography was nearly £40,000. Um, in England, it was even more, 57, and in Scotland, 59K. Mm. So there's clearly huge variation within the sector and huge potential for many farms that still add value in terms of the hill flock. Next, please. So when we talk about adding value to hill sheep, what are we thinking about? Um, well, I guess we're thinking about um, efficient, productive use. Um, with thinking about the outputs of the flock, so the weight and the quality of lamb sold from the flock, which is the principal source of income from the flock. But we probably have to think a little bit wider than that, and maybe a little bit wider than straight economics, in that the hill sheep also add huge value in their ability to use hill ground. And I often call them the landscape maintainers for many of our most beautiful areas in Britain, which we as people involved in sheep farming value, but the British public value very much as well. So they have an environmental role in managing those landscapes as well. And we have to think about maintaining that as well as the profitability of the farmers that live in those areas. And of course, sales of breeding stock are also important sources of income for hill flocks. So that might be ewe lambs, um, it might be draft ewes, it might be breeding rams. Next, please. So if we think about genetically improvement to add value to the hill flock, um, we know that genetic improvement is a way, great way to add value because it's cost effective, it's permanent, it's cumulative, it's sustainable. But on the other hand, we also know that in hill flocks, it's quite difficult. Um, and that explains much of the reason why um, the performance recording and use of EBVs, etc., isn't as common in hill flocks as it is in other flocks. And we've had that in discussions yesterday, that that has come up. So we have few recorded flocks, so it's actually difficult for people to source animals with EBVs that have been genetically evaluated in the hill breeds, which is a limitation. We have a complex breeding objective, which I'll talk a little bit more about, um, with many traits involved. Um, so we see gradual change in individual traits, so it can be harder to actually monitor and be aware of progress. The physical environment that we farm them in makes them difficult to record. And yet it's still really important that we do farm them and record them in that environment. So we are sure that they will perform in that environment. And in the hill sector, we have traditional attitudes. We have traditional attitudes in the whole of the sheep industry, but they're particularly strongly held in the hill sector. And there's particularly many areas of the hill sector where there would be a belief that we judge sheep by eye and the EBVs have little to add to that. So there are barriers to break down in terms of attitude and understanding. Next, please. So our, our hill flocks are complex beasts, our hill ewe is a complex beast, and we have many things to think about in terms of improving them. So our main cogs in terms of improving output are gonna be the lambs reared per ewe, the live weight sold and carcass weights, but we also have to consider that cost of production. Next. So if we think about improving this, what do we need to improve? Well, one thing that we probably need to improve in our hill sheep is lamb survival. Next. We need to improve the weight of lamb weaned per ewe. Next. Carcass weight and grade because it's an output from the flock. And we also need to ensure that we meet market requirements in terms of that. When we think about the cost of production, 
we need to get use into a target condition score for tupping for optimum efficiency and optimum output. So that is a cost in the system, and we need to improve the usability to regain that condition after weaning. So we need to improve you condition. But while we're doing all that, we also need to limit increases in new weight so we don't increase costs of production in a way that we might expect to in improving those other traits. Next. And when we do an economic analysis of what will drive output in a hill flock, generally, in most flocks, we probably gradually need to increase scanning percentage. Now, that might not be so in all flocks, but in most hill flocks, that is the case. Next, please. So the hill ram scheme, which Gua Parry introduced to Street Breeders Roundtable two years ago, um, was initially set up to try and meet some of these requirements and to improve hill sheep within Wales. So the general aims of the scheme were to increase the number of recorded hill flocks in Wales. So when people want to buy genetically improved hill sheep with EBVs, they are available. Um, to establish ways of selling recorded rams, to facilitate genetic improvement in the hill environment, so actually using the hill through using technologies such as DNA parentage, um, and to achieve a critical mass of improved sheep that would improve the whole of the Welsh sheep industry in terms of efficiency, which obviously will have knock-ons for not only financial viability, but also environmental impact as well. Next. So the scheme started in 2019. So what I'm going to do is just a little bit of an update of where we are now and talk about some of the lessons we've learned in terms of applying some of the technology. So in terms of update, the original target was to um, get to a stage of having 45 new recorded flocks in Wales, in addition to the seven or eight original flocks that have recorded their hill sheep in Wales for quite a long time. And we've surpassed that target in that we now have 54 new recorded hill flocks in Wales. Um, and as you can see from the map on the right, they're spread throughout most of the hill areas in Wales with good representations of where the majority of the hill sheep are. Um, also, as a result of that, we um, the breeders have established a marketing group known as Pro Hill um, to support sales and support each other in their efforts for marketing for sheep. And within many of these flocks, we've used DNA parentage to help recording in the hill environment, and that's been used successfully to record up to 12,000 ewes a year in that hill environment. So we certainly got to a situation where we're recording many more hill sheep in Wales. Next, please. Um, a little bit of a timeline here. So in 2019, um, we started off with um, tw seven flocks that were using DNA to do their recording um, and genotyped just over two and a half thousand ewes that produced about two and a half thousand lambs that were genotyped. Um, we didn't have a shocking lambing percentage, that two and a half thousand ewes included yearlings that didn't lamb that year. Um, in 2020, they were joined by another 23 flocks using DNA and a number of flocks that chose to manually record, which I'm not showing on this slide. Um, so they genotyped a further 8,000 ewes and together all the flocks um, genotyped 9,000 lambs that year and used the DNA to assign parentage. Autumn of 2021, sorry, autumn of 2020, a further group of flocks joined so that they were lambing for the first time in 2021. So we were then up to 28 flock, 48 flocks using the DNA. Um, and to date, about 9,500 ewes have been genotyped and there are still yearling samples coming in, which is why I can't have a final figure on that. And nearly 14 and a half thousand lambs um, were recorded using DNA parentage in 2021. Um, the scheme is continuing for a further two years to support this work. 
Um, so in 2022, as far as we are aware at the moment, we think we have 45 flocks continuing to use DNA. With the flocks that aren't continuing to use DNA, the majority of them will continue with manual recording. Um, and throughout this period, we've had a number of other flocks join each year who are using manual recording. So doing all the recording, just not using DNA parentage assignment. They're tagging at birth. Next, please. So a little bit of detail about um, what we've been doing. Um, so the genotyping um, is being done by genomes um, in New Zealand. Um, the ewes and lambs have been to date genotyped on a 17K um, SNP chip, their XT chip. So we have about 42,000 genotypes from those banked from the start of the project. Um, they, in the next year, will be moving on to a 60K chip. Um, as genomes have developed that, and we'll be rolling that out for this service. Um, and all RAMs used within the scheme um, are genotyped on a high density 600K SNP chip. Um, and that's, we make that service available not only to the flocks that are using the DNA for parentage assignment, but all the flocks that record include manually recorded flocks so that they can have their stock size genotyped on that, so that they're in the bank um, with data ready for future uses of that genotypic information when hopefully we'll be able to use it further. So we have a five and a half, about 500, 545 of those um, stored away. Next slide, please. So in terms of parentage assignments, I know in previous Sheep Breeders Roundtables, various people have talked about this, but I think it's interesting just to see how it's working in practice and how it's working um, in the flocks. So um, in terms of accuracy of the assignment, um, this last year um, for the flocks that were doing it, um, 26 of the flocks had greater than 95% assignment. In other words, both sire and dam were accurately assigned to the lambs. Um, so that compares very favourably with careful manual recording, where there's usually a lamb or two that doesn't get sire or dam assigned. Um, 10 flocks were in the bracket between 90 and 95%, and there were nine flocks that had less than 90%. Now, there were a number of flocks that get over 98% and we have several flocks achieving 100% of sire and dam assigned. We know the technology can assign to 100% accuracy. Um, it's applying it on farm where things fall down. And so it's interesting just to look at some of the reasons why we sometimes don't get as high an assignment as we like to. When we analyze those flocks that had less than 90% assignment, um, one of the main reasons for that is um, dam could not be assigned and when we've investigated that further it's usually because um, ewes have been mixed into the flock that haven't been genotyped um, so we haven't fully genotyped them all or um, lambs have got through into a wrong group or something like that. Um, so that kind of highlights one of the problems and um, particularly in a lot of these flocks where they're running maybe A and B flocks or a recorded flock and a non-recorded flock um, within the same farm and use sometimes getting mixed up that aren't genotyped. Another reason for um, lower assignment is where sires, so there's an unknown sire, so we can assign dam but not sire. And usually on investigation, um, the comment comes back, oh yes, the neighbor's ram did get in or, oh yes, there was one ram that I forgot to sample and send you the sample mm. for. So um, that's something that's usually fairly easily remedied, but it's just one of those things that happens. Um, and we did have several flocks where there was incomplete sampling because, um, again, ewes and lambs may have got mixed up with recorded and unrecorded flocks, um, or date of birth had not been recorded, and so it wasn't worth sampling the lambs because they couldn't be fully recorded. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Next slide, please. So some of the challenges of recording the flock on the hill, and most of these um, flocks are recording on the hill. So one of the challenges is recording date of birth. Now for good genetic evaluation, um, particularly of weights, we need an age of lambs, which 
Signet will make adjustments for when they calculate EBVs. Now that's easily recorded if you're tagging at birth, but if you're not tagging at birth, and the way that the parentage assignment works in these flocks is at about four to eight weeks of age, um, when the lamb, ewes and lambs are gathered, the lambs are then tagged and a tissue sample taken to assign sire and dam. So we don't have an accurate date of birth on them. So we have to get past that problem somehow. And different flocks will approach this in different ways, but generally um, most can mark accurately to at least have week of birth of the lambs. Now they might do that at tupping time by recording tupping dates. They may do it through fetal aging at pregnancy scanning, or many will have a way of marking that um, at birth of the lambs. So a colour mark for week of birth or numbers on you so that they can write down when they notice a you with lambs etc and most flocks are doing that accurately but sometimes it's taking flocks a little time to work out a system that works well for them so with some of the newer flocks it just takes a little bit of time to work that out um, another thing that um, again takes a little bit of time to work into flock management is aligning measurement windows for the key weights, like an eight-week weight, with actually routine gathers of the hill. Um, and they don't always coincide comfortably, particularly when there are um, common grazings on hills and it's very much a group effort um, doing a gather of the hill. So again, that's one of the things that we just have to work through and try and find ways um, that we can get around that. But again, most flocks can achieve it. And the third um, challenge that I really see and that some of our members have come across, and we saw it in the parentage assignment results, is being able to manage a separate nucleus flock within the farm. Now, sometimes that works very well and very naturally, and it can be done well. Other times it's difficult because sheep are being mixed at different times of year. So when they go on the hill, et cetera, so they, they can't have too many smaller groups. So again, that sometimes can cause difficulty and it's just something that members of the scheme have had to think their way through and work out how they're going to do it. Next slide, please. So if we want to add value to the flocks, it's not just about recording and getting EBVs, but it's about using those EBVs effectively. And so the scheme um, has many events and occasions where we can help our members and we train and support them in the use of those EBVs to really add value to their flocks. And the way they do that may be different for different flocks, um, so we have to cater for that. Um, they're also making sure that there's always someone on the end of the phone that can help them when they're wanting to make decisions, want, they're wanting to interpret the EBVs and indexes that they're receiving. As well as that, um, Signet has been very busy. Sam and his team at Signet have been very busy um, over the last couple of years in helping develop um, the indexes and EBVs to best meet the requirements of not only the hill farmers in Wales, but all the hill breeds throughout the UK. So I was heavily involved in helping revise the index. So it's um, a revision of the indexes that we used before to try and make sure it's fit for purpose going into the future. Um, a number of new EBVs have been developed for the hill breeds, um, such as lamb survival, a new weight, which Signet and the team at eGenes have been working on. And the hill breeds are now all analyzed together in a multi-breed evaluation that's run monthly. So very up-to-date EBVs are available throughout the season. Next slide, please. So we also wanted to address um, the problems of selling rams with EBVs. As I said, there are very traditional attitudes um, to selection and purchase of breeding stock, particularly within the hill sector, that we can't ignore and we have to address. Um, and to support our members in increasing the value of the breeding stock they sell by being able to provide them with EBVs. This is crucial not only because the technology um, that they're using, the DNA parentage, has a cost. And one way, of, one way of meeting that cost is to, through sales of rams, 
benefiting from the use of that technology. So in order to do that, um, we already had a very keen group of breeders within Wales, um, Welsh Mountain breeders and Beulah breeders who worked hard to market their stock. And we've built upon that um, and a group of them have formed together to form the Pro Hill group um, that's to there to help marketing for members of the scheme and anyone breeding hill sheep in, the, in Wales. Um, one of the aims of the scheme is to help the um, breeders develop social media pro profiles and build their flock profiles through social media so that they become known to the customers um, and there was a lot of talk yesterday about building the relationship between ram breeders and customers and that's exactly what this is all about and Innovis has been very involved in supporting that. Those breeders also host an annual sale in Aberystwyth um, with online bidding and viewing so that the rams are available throughout the country um, and that has been very successful in the last few years with well, a number of the new recruits into the scheme being very successful in selling their rams in that way. But the group also supports any marketing activity of members, whether they're doing on-farm sales, private sales, or selling at breed society or established sales. So it's a group there just to support marketing and help with training and support of that sort of activity. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just some of the material that's been um, produced. Um, we've got a picture there of the sale at Aberystwyth with one of the new members of the scheme successfully selling rams, um, a catalogue from 2020 and some of the social media posts promoting rams for sale at various sales throughout Wales um, this autumn. Next slide, please. So what's the future um, in terms of the scheme? Well, the scheme has another two years to run, but I think um, there's been a sea change and much of the momentum of it will carry on way beyond the end of the scheme. Um, some of our immediate um, priorities in terms of it are demonstrating benefits to the commercial hill farmer and the ram purchaser of using recorded sheep. So that's something that we will be working on. Um, it's important, we've certainly gained critical mass um, in terms of recorded and genetically improved hill sheep um, within Wales during the course of the scheme, but the challenge is to maintain that for the duration of the scheme and well beyond it. So the, the real benefits of this genetic improvement can be seen because we know that genetic improvement is a slow process, particularly in the hill flock with the complex objectives. We also have, we've used genomics um, for DNA parentage assignment within the scheme, and it's been a great enabling technology to allow that recording on the hill and in the hill environment. But as a consequence of that, we now have a lot of genomic data, and there has to be a lot of power in that data. So, in the future, we hope to be able to harness the power of that date, genomic data when we have the phenotypic data to go with it to really push on and do some more innovative breeding in the future. So I really want to finish there. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, by just paying tribute, and these are just a few of the members of the scheme. Um, but these are the guys and girls who are really adding value to their hill flocks by being innovative, taking on new technology, working hard and trying to do the very best for their flocks and for some of them, their RAM customers. So I'm now going to hand over to Irwell, who will tell you about what's happening in his flock. Uh, many thanks. Janet, thank you very much for an um, excellent presentation. Um, to the audience out there, uh, please do submit your questions into the questions box. And um, I'll just give a very brief introduction to, to EOL and then he can, um, can crack on with his presentation. So just, just for those of you who don't know EOL, he farms in partnership with his wife, Charlene Adaba Brandy. And it's a, that's an upland farm in Carmarthenshire and he's gonna tell you a bit more about that. And he has two young daughters, Lily and Annie. So after completing a degree in agriculture at Aberystwyth University, Earwell returned home to work on the family farm. 
and supplemented his income and gained lots of experience by working on different local farms, contracting and at the nearby agricultural college. But once he returned to the farm, he joined the partnership with his parents and through a gradual succession plan has now taken over the full running of the business. Um, obviously, Aowell has other interests outside farming, including being very active in um, young farmers and enjoyed playing, at the past tense, enjoyed playing rugby for a local side but I think he still enjoys watching the sport. So with, um, with that brief introduction, I will um, hand over to Eowell. Just Sorry, just to note that we'll have a full question and answer session when Eowell has um, finished his presentation. So thank you, Eowell. Thank you, Heather. Uh, yes, unfortunately, the rugby playing and the young farmer day has, uh, has passed on uh, at the moment then. Um, yeah, so... Uh, I'm Irwell Jones, and uh, if we move on to the next slide, then um, <clears throat> just a bit to tell you about where we are. We're right uh, smack bang in the middle of the spine of Wales, at the bottom end of the Cambrian Mountains, um, up at the top end of the Cothi uh, and Towy Valleys. Uh, there. So, if we move on to the next slide, please. So, Aberbrandy is the home farm uh, where I farm. Uh, with my wife, and um, we have 625 acres at home, but only 200, 300 are effective acres. We, as you can see from the picture, we've got about 160 acres of oak woodland on the farm, and also there's uh, the remainder being rough grazing, wet ground. Uh, so a really good mix uh, of, of a bit of everything. We also have 255 hill rights on uh, common land, which adjoins the farm. Uh, over to the left of the valley of the picture. And uh, most of uh, we've got some low lying land, uh, lowish lying land at the bottom of the valley, which is fairly damp. And then uh, our main block of land is up on the right hand side of that picture. So the land down by the farm there is at about 650 feet and it raises up to about 1350. And uh, we're in a high rainfall area um, as well. We've got about 80 inches plus most years. So um, a couple of years ago, we managed to rent a farm down the valley, um, just a couple of miles down, and that's uh, 350 acres in total. And uh, there's 70 acres of lower ground and 280 uh, acres of improved, uh, un unimproved hill ground uh, that's enclosed on that. So next slide, please. So um, as, as, as you could see from the breakdown of the ground, then um, we've got uh, a lot of habitat. So we entered the Gloucester Advanced Agri-Environment uh, Agri Scheme, and we've been trying to work alongside that uh, and try and get the balance between being productive and also um, keeping the land in good environmental uh, like this then. So at the home farm, we've got 950 ewes and they would be all be together on Welsh mountains. Um, 40 cow suckler herd, mainly continental crosses. Um, and we sell those off as wean calves. And then on the rented farm, there's a further 560 ewes and a small uh, dairy beef enterprise. Uh, just to get the balance of stock, uh, personally, I like to see cattle and sheep grazing alongside each other as they complement each other, and having too many of one or the other um, doesn't benefit the grazing. Uh, so if we can move on to the next slide. Uh, the sheep enterprise then, uh, we record, uh, Sigmund record uh, 500 just over 500 ewes this year, um, and there's about 400 of those that have uh, involved with the DNA parented side, and then we've still uh, got a hundred that are manually recorded. Um, there's, there's, as, as I said, we've got hill rights on the common, and there's 200 ewes that go up to lamb on there, and they're all bred pure. And then um, 240 at home, and uh, 560 ewes in what I call the beef flock, then uh, I put an Aberfield tub. Uh, and we also tap some ewe lambs. Um, uh, they're tacked away in the winter on daily ground, so um, I see lambing them 
uh, helps pay for the tack and also I think it benefits the ewe lamb uh, makes her a better mother by the time she is uh, coming into the recorded flock. Uh, so if we can move to the next slide, please. So in terms of our targeting sales, um, we sell about 350 Aberfield ewe lambs, cross ewe lambs every year um, down country. Um, and they are sold privately off the farm, getting uh, links through uh, and introductions to Inivis, uh, who we get the rams from. Uh, we're also selling uh, recorded rams, and we sell those at the Pro Hill sale, as mentioned before, in Aberystwyth, and also we sell it uh, at Tregaron, which is uh, where we traditionally have been selling rams for a number of years. Um, any surplus males then uh, from the home farm are normally uh, finished, uh, so dead weight uh, averaging approximately 18 kilos um, to dawn in Llanabother, which is only half an hour away. We're very lucky to have a slaughterhouse quite close and um, generally as a rule from the rented block. Um, we sell those as store in local marts and um, we do try and uh, get an element of flexibility in that and um, we're trying to be more adaptable now uh, and uh, ready to sell earlier, uh, the lambs earlier, and maybe not finished in order to prioritise the ewes, uh, whereas uh, in previous years we have been stuck on, we must finish everything, uh, even if we have to pay for the feed, uh, but maybe that's a change of attitude starting to come. So if we move on to the next slide, um, our sheep system, uh, and I'm mainly going to talk about the main recorded flock. Um, we have a 55 kilo average ewe weight, which I think is um, suits our ground. Um, and although that and we, we, that's pretty consistent over the last five years, but uh, through the recording now, I, I'm hoping to maybe bring that down a touch uh, to get a more efficient uh, sheep then. Um, we rear approximately 135% at the moment, uh, and our eight-week weights over the last five years have averaged just over 20 kilos, and we wean at 100 days, and we're, uh, we're hitting approximately 28 and a half kilos of weaning. Uh, so plenty of room to improve, and uh, hopefully we'll be heading towards that. I've noted there that we're on a forage-based system, but in the last... Uh, two years we have cut out the concentrates for the main ewe flock then. Uh, we do still teach all the ewe lambs that we plan on keeping uh, to eat concentrates in their first winter because uh, I think it's important to be adaptable. I'm not against feeding uh, but I only want to feed if I really have to but I want uh, if that situation does arrive I want uh, the Ewes to know what it is so that they don't get a check. So we haven't used any concentrates in the main ewe flock for the last two years. Uh, and we do that by, uh, we've moved uh, a little later lambing. Um, we've moved forward about two and a half to three weeks from where we were originally. We've taken on uh, a rotational grazing, um, trying to move um, every four to six days uh, when they are in their rotation and uh, our our field size uh, on the on the enclosed ground is about five acres. Uh, we do tack about half uh, the ewes away because of the uh, nature stops growing for about four months in the winter. And uh, it's, uh, as I mentioned before, it's quite wet. Uh, so half the ewes are tacked away and then the other half will be on a forage crop of Swedes and turnips from uh, Christmas time until the 1st of March. They then go back onto grass um, for the month of March um, and then uh, something we've saved up and then hopefully uh, things may be starting to grow by then and we'll hit the lambing time and uh, go from there. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So why would I want to join the Hillram scheme? Well, we've been recording uh, since the early 2000s uh, for a while with Signet, and then we um, we sort of lost faith really in the recording system 
because there wasn't uh, enough people recording, um, we were struggling to make progress because we were having to buy unrecorded rams in, um, and then we were uh, hit and miss whether they would be uh, any good, really. Uh, so we were not making the progress we would have liked. Um, so we dipped out of the Signet recording, but we kept on recording uh, lots of data and uh, using them just on farm. So when the chance to join the scheme, in, uh, scheme came, we, just, we saw it as a logical thing to happen. And uh, we're just looking to make, within an, uh, we've reached a stage now where uh, the, big, the big gains were made maybe by the previous generation. Uh, my father always says that when he left school uh, on this farm, they had uh, 350 ewes and they had six sets of twins. And by the time he passed over to me, we were uh, up to 700 ewes and maybe 300 odd twins. So now we're really just looking to make small gains in a lot of different areas. Um, and this, this was one way I could see of making it. And really, I want to make a more consistent flock of ewes cut out uh, maybe the bottom 20-25% of underperformers and whilst also keeping the type of ewe I want uh, to keep. So next slide, if you please. So what have been the challenges? Um, and it's, it's something that um, Janet touched on earlier. It's uh, the main, one of the main challenges for us has been managing the DNA and non-DNA uh, flocks. We were keen to, I think it's a good thing for us to have as, as big a number of views recorded as we could manage. Um, and that didn't quite fit in with the, with the DNA budgets then. So um, we've continued to record both flocks and that has its challenges, uh, but I think we get through that. So we've been doing big bigger mobs, uh, for mating then, so maybe uh, groups of 200 uh, in one batch of DNA. And uh, one of the downsides of that is then you put three or four rams in with that bunch, and then you'll find maybe it's not the ram you wanted um, that has been most prolific. And what we found uh, through doing the DNA then is maybe a more dominant ram will have almost double uh, the amount of lambs of some of the other groups. Uh, for example, there was one group this year um, that had 200 lambs and uh, 103 rams had been used, and there was 100 lambs with one sire and 50 each with the other two. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not just uh, it's not just recording um, the signet recording and the, getting the data and the EBVs. It's just part of the toolkit. Uh, and, and, it, and there's a bigger picture uh, where we're trying to produce a functional sheep. Um, so not only is it going to try and have good figures, also we want it to be uh, long lasting and able to look after itself in the harsh environments. So, as I said uh, previously, hand in hand with joining the scheme, we, we've gone to use less feed and concentrates and cut that out. And that's bought its own. Uh, little niggles as it's exposed maybe um, some of the trace element issues uh, which we were uh, aware of maybe but they've come more to light now having cut out the feed because that was just covering up uh, some of the some of the things so we've been working hard over the over the three years now to try and uh, pinpoint uh, what's short and get the right program and um, and then the right timeline in place so that we can cover all of these. And uh, just one other challenge at the bottom is, uh, and this is maybe uh, something that's come through with COVID as well, and uh, we were having trouble sending them off. We were sending some, uh, screening some ewes, uh, post-mortem, some cal ewes, uh, to, to sort of uh, look at some of the iceberg diseases and try and improve our health status. Uh, but that's one of the challenges we face and one of the things we need to look at going forward is how we prove uh, the health status of our flocks and give uh, our customers a better guarantee that what they're, uh, what they're buying is uh, going to be fit and healthy. 
and down also we want it um, for our own flocks as well so next slide please so the benefits of joining the scheme well as as janet mentioned uh, the genetic pool uh, we've got uh, almost 50 flocks according to now so that is giving us more recorded rams to choose from um, and it's enabling us to have more control over the breeding program uh, another thing i've seen uh, in just this short time of uh, two years since we've been uh, in the scheme uh, the lamb crop is certainly more consistent and cutting out some of the poor doers um, and, and we're seeing that the welsh welsh flock is improving and then maybe some of the uh, beef flock lambs are, uh, are not quite up to scratch and it just takes the guesswork uh, out a little bit of what we're doing next slide please uh also the benefit and just uh just to highlight it um this is something that um, sam boone has uh has created for a case study for us and it just highlights the fact that uh what our eight uh week weights have been doing over the last few years and as you can see since we started back recording uh with signet and um uh, joining the hill ram scheme we are making gains uh, in the right direction next slide and here we have then just to highlight um we used 11 sires in the year 2019 and as you can see um there's a difference in the weights as you would expect uh, but if you drill down into that that's a, there's a four kilo difference um from the lambs in the top three to the bottom three and uh, four kilos uh, when you multiply it into pounds uh, by live weight and then by the number of lambs in the group uh, it can make quite an, quite an impact so definitely a positive story to show there next slide please so a big part of the um, hill ram scheme uh, this time round and recording is the dna sampling so as janet touched on earlier it's uh helps with the record accuracy of recording and even with our little glitches um with having a non dna flock and a dna flock we've still managed to get 96 percent accuracy um this year so that's that's a good just gives you that extra layer of um of, of, of assurance then the multiple sire mating although i said earlier that uh it's there's no guarantee of what you get you do get but you, of what whether your best rams will produce as many lambs as you want at least you've got a lamb because um uh, you're not just putting once a single sire in so it gives you that assurance and the dna sampling um obviously means less labor at lambing when you are at your most busy um we still spray a color on all the lambs at lambing but catching it to just put us put a line in a color uh is much less interference than trying to tag it and uh, do individual uh things to it so that's a lot less and we change the color every five days that's our chosen method um and that gives us an accurate lambing date then uh anything then which we have to handle and bring in the shed gets tagged at birth um, so that we know then that there has been uh, a problem and that can be uh, kept back from going into the main flock as a replacement then. And also there is less interference in lambing. So you just, uh, that I feel that lamb then gets a head start and uh, it saves me running after it when it gets to a day old because uh, I'm not as fit as I used to be. So the downside obviously is the cost and um uh it's a big thing uh it's quite a, a, a big cost um probably around 15 pound for the total cost and um even even if i try and stretch everything i'm i'm finding it difficult to justify that cost I, uh above sort of five six maybe up to eight pounds if i really stretch it if i count the uh, what i'm saving as labor and all of the above things i mentioned so are we going to be able to justify that cost 
uh, going forward? Is the cost going to come down? Those are the big questions that we're looking at. And uh, well, we're, uh, but I am excited to see how the genomic side of it is going to work and whether that is going to be able to add the value uh, to make it cost effective to carry on doing it. Um, not that I would, I, I'm very enthusiastic about keeping recording, but whether we keep DNA sampling on the scale we are doing now is something that has to be proven and have to be um, thought about over the next year. Next slide, please. So future plans, um, basically uh, creating a, a, resil a more resilient flock. Um, and that means probably for us creating a nucleus of 150, we'll have had three or four years data coming in uh, now, and we'll be looking to create a nucleus flock of maybe 150 of the uh, best type, the highest index DNA recorded sheep, uh, and then continue to record everything that is bred pure, but not on, with the DNA then. Um, but we have to, as, as I said earlier, it's uh, it's more than just high index sheep. We are looking to create uh, something, and this is nothing new. It's, and there's plenty of people doing it out there. But personally, we just kind of create uh, a, a, and improve so that we have a sheep that is fit for purpose. Uh, we can sell with confidence. So we're concentrating on weeding out and uh, really killing much harder on the problems uh, that we've got improving our health status and then improving that so we can give the best product to our customers. Um, and hopefully uh, I will be keeping more animals pure as we build up the number of high index animals, uh, crossing a bit less and maybe develop some new lamb sales um, going forward. So uh, next slide, please. That brings me to a close. I'm sure I've missed a few bits out, but um, if there's any questions, I'm sure we'll have it at the end. And thank you very much for listening. Ewell, thank you very much indeed for an excellent presentation. You can all see why um, Ewell makes um, a, an excellent leader flock in our Hill Ram Scheme project. Um, the questions have been um, coming in thick and fast. Um, I'm going to go um, first to Ewell as, he's, as it's sort of fresh in everyone's mind. Um, yeah, well, what's your target slaughter weight, slaughter spec, weight and grade, and um, what proportion of your flock are able to hit the target? Um, we, we're aiming to get them to about 40 kilos minimum, uh, like I said, uh, 18 kilos, 17.5 to 18.5 kilos generally at R3L, I'm very happy with, and uh, we're normally hitting about 85 percent in spec uh, when we do that then uh, but as okay. i say as i said in, in the presentation really we, we're trying to change mindset now and prioritize the eu um, from the middle of october onwards and make sure that we've got enough grass to keep the eu in the right condition for the year after so we're much more i'm much more um adaptable to selling as stores whereas maybe three or four years ago i would be more stubborn and get the cake bag out if i had to okay great great thank you very much and i think the other sorry the other bit of the question was and i think you sort of answered that you've been, have you seen it improved prove over the over the years um you know has it been easier to meet your spec yeah yeah well um it, 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 when you take the cake bag out, it takes a bit of time to adjust, but uh, certainly there's, yeah, there's, there's definitely uh, an improvement. Okay, great. Thank you. That's a, that's a good answer. Then I, and I'll come to Janet in a minute. There's just one more here, that, and then we'll give you a little rest here. Well, um, how do you think we can inspire, encourage more traditionally minded hill farmers to engage with enhanced performance and production for profit? Um, what is the standout benefit for you? I think it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, it's definitely a challenge and one that's not going to come overnight. Um, and maybe it's something that's generational and it and it and it's going to take that long to change, to be honest. But um, um, 
I think it's just well, in terms of sales of rams, what I've seen is we we also don't feed uh, concentrates to any of our rams, and um, we've seen we've seen people not not quite uh, not believing that we don't feed them, uh, and it just takes it takes somebody to, to go back and then i've had several people come back this year and say well you said the truth that ram didn't come and eat and i think it's got to be a slow thing and spread the word spreading basically um it's a word of mouth thing and it's going to take a couple of years but hopefully if we stick at it uh we'll get there okay brilliant great answer and coupled with excellent grassland management i'm sure um i'll just um switch to janet now um a question came in at, at, about how is the um, genetic sampling done? Yep, that's a good question. So um, the way that it's done is um, initially um, we take um, small tissue samples from the years of um, the sheep to get our DNA sample from it. Um, initially, we do that from all the ewes in the flock and all the rams ewes, so we have the parents all profiled. And then on an annual basis, um, we do that for lambs, as I said, when it can coincides with another management task, often the first gather, um, if they've lambed on the hill, so when they're maybe four weeks old, in that period between four and eight weeks, and we take a small tissue sample from the lambs, um, DNA profile that, and then we can match to the sires and the dams. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Janet. And then the next sort of um, question, which it will sort of, sort of touched on in a way, is if the breeders are using DNA parentage, um, sorry, if the breeders using DNA parentage are multi sire mating groups on the hill, is there an opportunity to collect? Um, so, no, is there an opportunity to collect information on ram fertility, and and breed for those ram fertility traits in the future? And, um, uh, guess, and, and also, the... is dominance part of a ram fertility trait? Yeah, and that was going to be part of my answer. That I guess there is. Um, I guess it's. Um, it is very much a, would be a practical measure of fertility so it's not just whether the ram is fertile or not it's much more about um dominance so there's a lot of behavior included in there as well in terms of actually who's dominating the ewes um but there is potential for that and there's certainly been a study in new zealand done on that using data from dna parentage um it's, it's interesting as well um Certainly, we've been finding that about 25% of sets of twins um, are sired by different sires where we've been using multiple sire mating. Um, and I think that's also interesting as well, how that might be related to you to ram ratio or ram dominance or whatever. But I, yeah, I guess there's plenty of potential for other free traits to come out of that I, sort of data. If I can cut in as well, I think, uh... The, the case which I highlighted earlier was uh, I, I had two high index yearlings that uh, that had the lower amount of lambs and a, a, an older tap which was more dominant. So it's it, it depends on the circumstance and the, and the age of the taps and everything can be factors in that. Yeah, absolutely. And it would require some quite complex data analysis to handle it. Okay, great. Thank, thank you, Janet. Um, there's another one for you, Janet, here. Do you have an indication of the proportion of breeders involved in the scheme, and do these tend to be less traditionalist anyway? Um, okay, again, uh, good question. Um, I guess as a proportion of total um, hill breed, hill ram breeders within Wales, um, it's, it's a small proportion. Um, and I guess by their very nature, they've been open to the scheme um, and have joined it of their own volition, um, so they do tend to be less traditionalist, although um, there are a number that are very well respected ram breeders um, and already have a very established traditional market for their rams. Um, so, so yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. Actually, my apologies, uh, there was a supplementary for EOL about the dominant ram. Quick question from Neil McGowan, has the dominant ram surprised you? Or would you have guessed it from his behaviour? Uh, no, I, I, I would have. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was pretty obvious when you saw him round. Yeah. Okay, great stuff. Um, 
the yeah sorry the, one of the other oh, i beg your pardon um there's another one for, for earwell of what proportion do you sell off farm if any so that is yeah that is what proportion of your finished oh. land i think but i think you yeah go on please answer that yeah what proportion of uh of lambs or of of your lambs i think do you sell off farm um yeah well we we sell the um the all the ewe lambs uh privately a farm everything else more or less goes to uh goes to yep. auction or something else. but then on the ram side they all go to auction at the moment but it's something i'm open to if anybody wants to buy a lamb <laughs> yeah. okay um Yes, um, just while I remember, I just need to remind anybody that is attending this that they, if they're part of the Rossa Sheep Advisor Group, they can earn CPD points for this and that they need to, um, if they haven't already done so, to email Carrie Ann with, with their details, their membership details. Um, there's, yeah, sorry, there's some more questions just come flying in. Um, I think this is one for Janet. Um, does the mature weight go into the index and is it taken into account by breeders as the hill tends to be extensive, so low use per hectare? Um, it does go into the index um, and it has a slight negative weighting in the index, so um, high mature weight will be um, penalised very slightly um, on a linear basis, but it's only a slight penalty. Um, with the aim of actually maintaining um, mature sizes, not allowing them to increase too much. Um, I think um, most of the um, breeders, and obviously everyone has very slightly different objectives for their flock and their hill, but most of the breeders would, I think, be in the category where they're saying, I don't want my ewes to get any bigger. Um, the very, Irwell's nodding there, I think most most of our members would be in that frame of mind, um, mainly because of the impact it has on the hill grazing and the ability to use as much of the hill ground for as much of the year as possible. Um, but maybe Irwell would like to say a little bit about that as well. Yes, certainly. Um, when we have in the past used rams, maybe they're of a, of a more less hardier type we've seen impacts with health and not as resilient to living on 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 the hill then so from my perspective uh i i i we're currently at about 55 kilos i'd be quite happy to go down to maybe 50 but that wouldn't mean that wouldn't mean reducing my use size really it would mean getting a more compact use size because our variation at the moment is probably from 45 to 70 so um working out if those 70 kilo ewes aren't pulling their weight well then they're going to come out to the figures really isn't they? okay great that's um that sounds good um another question for you eol um do you find winter grass management easier when you um when you're not single cell mating i.e you can run larger mobs definitely that's been a that's been a big benefit as well because um we're able to save more for the post tipping period, really, uh, and it just gives us that extra month then before they hit the forage crop. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you both very much indeed. Um, I think that really is all we've got time for. We will um, answer any unanswered questions that have appeared in the questions, and uh, we will get back to you. Um, and so now I'd just like to thank thank Earwell and Janet very much again, and I will hand over to to John Richards for the next um, part of this webinar. Great stuff. Uh, thank, thank you, and and with that, Paul. Um, thank you to to the two speakers that we just had. Really interesting uh, start to the evening, and a, a good uh, prelude, really, to to the next presentation that we've got. And um, yeah, so so just to kind of introduce myself, I'm John Richards. I work with Heather at Habiki Cymru, um, and and work in the industry development team. Um, obviously, we would have liked to be doing this in person and meet everyone, but there are some benefits to doing things remotely like this, and one of them is to be able to rely on experts such as the next speaker that we've got coming up. 
Um, I'll do the quick intro. Um, I, I won't do John any justice at all, the intro that I'm going to give him, but I'll, I'll quickly go through that now. So the next speaker we've got to talk about genomic data and the opportunities that we've got as a, as a, a sheep sector uh, is John McEwen. And, and John McEwen is a scientist uh, in agri-research animal genomic team based at Invermay. John has worked at agri-research and is forerunner Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries since 1979. Most of his research is involved in gen genetic and now genomic improvement of sheep, including disease resistance and meat and carcass quality. In most recent years, uh, the focus has shifted to the reduction of ruminant methane emissions, which, as we'd all agree, that is very topical for this time uh, and particularly in the last month with everything going on in Glasgow. John has also been heavily involved in the development of, of low-cost genome genotyping by sequencing methodologies in a wide variety of species. So again, that kind of leads into some of the discussion that Irwell was having about the cost of, of, of DNA. Now, as you see, I, I've read most of that, and apologies for that, but I, I just wanted to make sure I didn't lose out in any detail. The one thing uh, John forgot to do when he was uh, giving us the intro was um, the good thing is with Google is you can just Google a name and you see, and actually I found probably the best headline I've seen for uh, for an introduction. And that came from, from the Otago Daily Times. And it was when John received uh, the, the Science New Zealand uh, Lifetime Achievement Award in 2017. And he was called the rock star of sheep science. Uh, science. So, um, you know, there's not many people you can actually introduce working for the in the red meat sector that you can say is the rock star of of the uh, information that you're about to hear. So that's who we are. Obviously, John, being a New Zealander, is a very avid sports fan. Um, not the best weekend, but then I'm not going to say anything because it was only a couple of weekends ago New Zealand put 50 points on Wales. So I won't go into any detail about that, but um, I, I'll leave the introductions there, I think, because it's more important really to have John to present and show all the kind of information that they have at their fingertips. And also, um, obviously, what we will do, though, is have um, the, the presentation itself will be around 25 to 25 minutes to half an hour and then we'll open it up for questions at the end so please keep your questions coming in to John and and hopefully we can have a good discussion at the end but for the time being um if I'll hand over to John good evening John or good morning John and again thank you for joining us early in the morning like this from New Zealand uh thanks John and um yeah thanks for the opportunity to uh speak as well um um Sharon McIntyre gave a talk uh, yesterday, I think, uh, or yesterday evening, uh, your time. And so I've, I've actually sort of concentrated um, on more what's a bit further up the pipeline, what's coming down the track on maternal traits um, in New Zealand. So some of this stuff might be uh, several years away. And I'm actually giving it on behalf of the team here. There's quite a few people involved. Uh, and the work that um, we're going to talk about. Next slide, please. Um, so I like to start out with a take home message. So um, um, basically, genomics really does help improve maternal traits. It's, it's, it's made, it has major benefits for sex limited traits that you can only measure in say females, maternal growth, survival, or traits that are measured late in life, like reproduction and longevity, typically after you've selected the females that you're going to keep, or traits where an animal's production is affected, like disease or stress that perhaps only some animals are exposed to or only in some years. And um, I, I've highlighted the next one, traits that are expensive to measure. So methane, Facial eczema in New Zealand, um, digital egg, egg measurements, uh, measurements that might um, be related to how much stress the animals are under, or, or traits that are expensive like microbiomes. So the idea here is, is you measure a few animals and you predict um, based on the DNA and the rest of them. And coming along with that package, and that's been discussed pretty well here, is traits that are um, difficult to measure under some management systems like parentage if they're lambed outdoors or birth date and extensive farming systems. 
And along with that, uh, people are often interested in single gene loci, particularly if it's a recessive trait and um, it's detrimental. And so we've got parentage assignment and breed composition. And in some cases, uh, people don't actually know what breed the animal is and they can uh, predict what composition of breed it is. So these benefits increase as the cost of genotyping declines and the amount of information that you get for the genotyping increases. Um, and it also, the benefits I'm hoping to show increases the number of animals genotyped in the reference data sets increases. So these are the data sets where the traits are measured and the animals are genotyped. Um, there is a change though when this happens and that's the selection emphasis shifts towards increased productivity with lower environmental uh, footprint and increased welfare because basically a lot of the traits that are difficult to measure tend to be dealing with those, those other things. Okay, so the challenge has been industry implementation. Next slide. Um, you've got a, a little picture up there of everybody going to sleep and I'm watching the number of attendees and I'm hoping it's not going to halve in the next two minutes. But I've put an equation up on my third slide and that's usually a, a killer. But really what I'm trying to say is much of what breeders need to know can be summarized in this breeders equation and um, put into words the rate of genetic change is dependent on how heritable it is, how hard you select for it, the amount of variation that's available and what's your generation length. Okay, um, and I'm going to be dealing uh, with the equation in the, the, at the bottom, which is the genetic change, delta G, is equal to the accuracy of the breeding values, I, the selection intensity, how much genetic variation is available, and L is the generation length. Next slide, please. So with genomic selection, the, the, the challenge is to increase the accuracy or at least get it equivalent to what you can do when you measure the individual animal and decrease the generation in, interval. Um, generally, the selection intensity stays the same, but you get an increase in the rate of genetic change. Okay, um, next slide, please. Um, so, one of the questions always comes through is why is genomics better than parentage? Well, it has to deal do with Mendelian sampling. So uh, each animal has two chromosomes and when you uh, a mother and father mate, um, their offspring might or uh, will inherit quite different segments from the grandparental chromosomes um, that are shown here in different colors. Um, so based on pedigree, each should share half of their DNA. However, about 50% of the genetic variation that's available is due to this Mendelian sampling. Next slide. And this is expressed here in um, how the genetics works. If you just know what the parentage is, um, if you've got two uh, full sibs, well, they basically, you know that they share half their parental DNA. Next slide, please. However, we know in practice you can get identical twins. Next slide. Um, well, yeah, well, they're probably not sharing exactly half their DNA, brother and sister. Next slide. And um, I'm not saying this happens in Wales, but obviously in some cases, um, what you think are uh, full sibs are not. Okay, uh, next slide. So instead of doing a parentage relationship matrix, um, you can use a GRM. Uh, next slide. And you'll see that this has differences. Uh, uh, next slide, uh, next, next um, one. So the first thing is um, 
that the mother and father you can detect might um, actually have some co-ancestry or some inbreeding. Next, next arrow. The inbreeding. Next arrow. Uh, um, obviously, the mother, the animals are going to be related to the mother and father by about 0.5. A final arrow. And but the key thing here is is that you get a better estimate of how related um, individuals are. Now, I've done this for full SIBs, but the truth is that the difference is as a portion, as a percentage um, between what you calculate just from parentage and what's actually happening for genomic estimates are quite a lot uh, bigger uh, as expressed as percentages when you get to more distant relatives. And that's one of the benefits of genomic selection. Uh, next slide. So how much better? Well, I've taken a, a trait here that has sex limited maternal trait. So when a lamb's born, you probably don't know how, how long its mother's going to last in the, in the flock. Um, but a key point here is that the genomic breeding value is available for the ram and ewe lambs prior to their selection, basically um, sometime around weaning if they've been DNA sampled at docking. And um, how accurate that uh, breeding value is depends on uh, how big the training set is. So this is the number of animals that have been genotyped in a breeding group working together like we've been discussing in, in, in what's happening in Wales. So if you've got a record on the dam, the accuracy is about 0.14. But if you've got uh, 10 or 20,000 genotyped, the accuracy can get up to about 0.3. So you're almost doubling um, the accuracy of the breeding value. And if all else stays the same, um, you'll make a lot more progress in that trait and that will have impact when it's included into the index. Next slide, please. So where's New Zealand maternal sheep genetics? Well, we've got about 27 million sheep now and about 17 million breeding ewes, and about 1% of the ewes and their progeny are performance recorded. Um, currently, our genetic evaluation for the maternal uh, traits and the NZGE consists of 11.4 million animals that have got records uh, from about 1995. Uh, we use a, what's called a single step multi-breed, BLUP multi-breed evaluation. Uh, so that means it mixes genotyped information with pedigree information, and it's done across multiple breeds. Um, and there's many uh, ram, composite ram breeding flocks, although most of them, if you look into it, have a Romney base. And just currently about 320 odd thousand animals have been genotyped on SNP chips, not DNA parentage, actually SNP chips from which DNA might be um, evolved as well. And about 145,000 of those are used in the maternal evaluation. And, and that's because the, the composition of the breeds is so uh, diverse that we, we have to restrict um, what animals we use the genotypes for, for the maternal evaluation, and the balance are used for the terminal evaluation or other things. Next slide, please. Um, often when people start talking about DNA, people, uh, we've got this in-house term called TAT, turnaround time. So, uh, so people sort of think that you can, you know, they watch um, CSI or something and they, they think that um, a cup of coffee's had and um, then the results are available. Um, well, turnaround time is important, okay. And I've got some pictures here of uh, people over in Australia with beef cattle who would really like to do it when just when they get the um, 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 get the muster of their cattle in once a year. Um, but in actual fact, 
Um, there's a, a lot more things involved than that. So it depends, turnaround time depends for the DNA test, depends on the management. And it depends a little bit if you're pregnancy scan or fetal age the females, which is typically what we do, whether you're lambing unshepherded, which is what um, a lot of people do here in New Zealand. Um, but if you sheep sample, a, a sample of lambs at docking, uh, you know, three, four weeks of age, or when they go up onto the mountain pasture, you can get your results back by when they come back from the mountains or at weaning at eight to 10 weeks of age. And you get all the information then in one time. So it's, it is actually not a problem, but I have to sort of admit that if you uh, were in the Northern Territories of Australia and you mustered your cattle twice a year and the males or the bulls are out all year round, um, you've, you've got a bit of a bigger challenge and they, uh, I'm gonna talk a bit about methylation later on so you can age the animals by methylation. Um, so in general, there's no problem with turnaround time um, and the results are available prior to selection is if you sample them around docking and um, you can get your results at weaning. Next slide, please. So I just want to put a one slide in here on digital data capture of maternal traits. And I, I see a future where we're going to get rich data capture of um, particularly extensively grazed animals, uh, of their movement and spatial grazing patterns, um, mating and estrus records, lambing behavior of the ewes and the lambs, um, probably estimates of milk production just simply by suckling times and things like that in the maternal behavior. Um, indirect or indicators of disease, like if they've got been parasitized, uh, does that affect their um, movements and grazing behavior or heat stress? And, and potentially the uh, golden um, promise is uh, grazing measurement of intake. Um, so that, there's going to be a lot of work done on this in the next few years. And uh, I've got a picture here of um, some high-vis sheep from Australia where they're doing work. So initially it's going to be expensive and we're only recorded on selected ant flocks and animals. And, and so once again, the whole reason for bringing this up, the results of this are going to be best disseminated via genomic selection into the wider population and it's actively under development in New Zealand, but still several years away. Next slide, please. So I'm going to now just pick two areas and give a little bit more detail uh, for maternal traits and what we're doing. And this work is by Alex Coulton, her PhD, uh, who's supervised by Shannon Clark here in the, um, in the lab. and I. Suppose I've got to start out and, and say, well, what is DNA methylation? Well, DNA is the hereditary material, and one of the four bases that's involved in um, recording that template uh, can be um, chemically altered by enzymes to be methylated. And if, uh, in general, and I'm summarizing this. Um, the people could criticize me, I'm just trying to summarize it down, is, is um, if it's methylated, um, that region tends to have less uh, transcription that essentially produces the, goes down and produces the proteins. Okay, so it's basically turned off. And if it's unmethylated, it tends to be um, transcribed. Whoops, go back please. Um, so, um, what is DNA methylation? So, it occurs in the DNA, it affects the gene expression, it can vary or be permanent in a cell. So, a muscle cell versus a skin cell. It's permanent for the life of that individual. But in mammals, these marks are almost always not carried into the next generation. And it can be assayed similar to genotyping on the same equipment. And so you're looking at specific sites and a proportion of sites that are methylated, and it acts as a cumulative marker. It, it basically tracks what's happened to the animal over its life, 
And and it, one of the key things is it can use the same sample as is sent in for genotyping. Next slide, please. So chronological age is strongly correlated with the DNA methylation levels. And so you can take the sample, assay it, and it'll tell you roughly what the age of the individual is. And in some cases, um, an individual is older than their actual chronological or age, how long they've actually lived. And in other cases, um, next, if you push the button, next slide, please. Uh, um, <clears throat> it can be a lot younger. So the animal appears at the DNA level to be younger than uh, what uh, you've measured. And so these can be used as a proxy for biological health. Um, and it, in humans, where they've studied it, you can pick out a smoker from a non-smoker. You can pick out uh, people that have been under a lot of stress or, or suffering some, for some metabolic diseases. Okay. And so people that tend to live longer tend to have a slower ticking epigenetic clock because this is what this methylation is often called epigenetics. Next slide, please. So we've been constructing a, a livestock clock here in New Zealand and uh, sheep, cattle, deer and goats, and they've been assayed um, up. Next slide. And then been selecting which ones are predictive, which sites are predictive of, of age in the different species. Next slide and plotting it out. And you can see here, the correlations with age are pretty good. Um, very good actu actually. Um, next slide, please. And this is the final one. And, and so the idea is to pick out four cattle, sheep and deer, goats and deer to pick out the actual sites that are most predictive in that species, right? And um, so that's been done and it's been published. Uh, move, uh, next slide, please. So what, are, what's, what can we use it for? So it, it's a key driver of adaptation and stress response. So it can be used to age animals, but it can also be used as a predictor of biological health. And it might be exploited as a proxy of stress phenotypes. So basically all the challenges that the individual animals coming up against. And longevity and stability may well be able to be predicted um, on the basis of this assay. And it would the results would be implemented via genomic selection. Okay. So in this case, it does depend, you know, there's some work about when you would actually uh, sample the animals, but there's work underway about how good the predictors are early for uh, later later estimates. So, so this work's underway, and the idea is, that particularly in extensive situations, this may well be a very uh, easy way to uh, try to get a handle on a very difficult trait, because if we want a lower environmental footprint, one of the best ways to do it is to make sure that we're not rearing uh, tutus that either have no or only one lamb. Um, right, applications within the livestock, uh, sorry, next slide please. Right, I just want to touch base on methane emissions. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is um, Tim Bilton, um, Suzanne Rowe and Melanie Hess's work. And basically, we've been working in this area for since about 2008, and we've tried to link SNP chips together with rapid measurements for methane. In this case, a trailer that takes animals around and you put them in for an hour and measure the methane emitted. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, and uh, next slide. So. How do we, what did we do? Well, we're, the blue line here of genetic progress uh, on the vertical axis, it's um, cents in New Zealand dollars, is um, essentially the New Zealand industry 
um, and it's actually the central progeny test. So this is the genetic trends in maternal worth index. And the orange line is one of our research flocks, and we created a selection line of high and low emitters but from both of those flocks, hence why they start out about in the middle and how you can see how that uh, over time they've been selected. Now, this is, we've been selecting for low or high methane emissions in the selection line flocks only, right? But you'll notice here that the maternal worth has changed, index has changed in these flocks, and generally uh, the low methane emission flock um, has higher maternal worth index. We just say, uh, all we say is, if you're selecting for low methane emissions, we're probably not going to be uh, cause many, if any, detrimental changes. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but we want to share the load and we want to do it by genomic prediction because e e even though it's quite cheap to do these uh, measurements in these chambers for an hour, it's still a cost and it's still quite expensive and it's logistically difficult. So the idea is, is to measure enough animals um, uh, 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 that we can predict in the rest of the uh, ram, ram flocks. So we're measuring representative animals using DNA relatedness. We estimate the GBVs and the relatives and it needs genetic linkage. And um, this uh, graph down here is, is that we're aiming for an accuracy of about 0.7 for this trait, which is close to a progeny tested RAM. Okay, uh, next slide please. So what progress have we made? So we, we did start in 2008, we did all this research work and, and we initially started measuring in the selection lines and some of the uh, progeny tests or central progeny test um, flocks. Um, and we built a pack trailer and started going around um, individual flocks in 2018. Uh, flocks, a few more flocks were, um, uh, came on board. Uh, Beef and Lamb New Zealand provided some offset to the cost in 2019. We decided that we could, um, uh, based on the results, move to just doing it once rather than twice, 14 days apart. And um, um, in 2021, we've got 34 flocks now, including all the progeny test flocks that have measured to date. Next slide, please. And how are we doing? Well, we've got flocks spread all around the country and we've got um, uh, animals um, from a, a wide variety of breeds that have been measured in uh, different years. But you can see the number of animals that have been measured in 2021 is really ramping up and we, we want uh, uh, to measure across breeds. Okay, next slide, please. We provide what we call research BVs on uh, back to the people that do the measurements, um, uh, giving their, um, these are some examples, giving their uh, BVs and ranks out. They're, they're ex essentially expressed as um, for a hogget, the um, grams of methane more or less that they emit um, per day. Um, obviously this is in a state of flux in New Zealand with carbon calculators and everything else. So these are research BVs. Um, next slide please. Um, in our uh, research, Ag Research Research Flock, Flock 2638, um, Suzanne's been selecting the top ram lamb per sire, 22 ram lambs from about 700 male progeny and had a look and this was starting in 2018 and, and starting to have a look at which one she should select as part of an index. And if she just selected them on the maternal index alone, the average um, uh, index value in New Zealand dollars was $36.65. Um, and um, if she did that, because basically the animals were getting bigger and heavier, 
uh, the change in methane production per generation would be about uh, an increase of about 1.7%. That's the the number uh, below on the green side. However, if she selected them on the maternal index plus a methane index where methane's uh, at $100 per ton CO2 um, um, uh, based on GWP 100, um, she, uh, the average economic value, or index value would be $35.63. Um, so that's a bit less. Um, a dollar less than um, just selecting on the maternal index alone. But if she in included the cost of the methane emissions in, in there, um, in actual fact, it, the index value would be $37.63. Um, so it would be about 98 cents more. The important point here is, is it's about three and a half percent lower methane emissions. So we've gone from increasing methane emissions to decreasing methane emissions. And on the right-hand side here, we've got the GBVs uh, for Flock 2638 over time. And starting about 2018, we started selection and you can see it's sloping down quite steeply now. So we've actually included it as sort of a demonstration in this research flock. Next slide, please. Um, and we've, while we've done that change, we've managed to actually keep or increase the rate of genetic change um, in, our, in our flock for the standard New Zealand maternal worth. And uh, you note down below here, I've got the genetic trend of the industry as a whole. So, so this is another aspect that's often ignored is Typically, uh, when you've got a selection index uh, available, the industry only probably makes 50 or 70 percent of the potential change, and and this is uh, showing that you can probably inc include methane BVs, and if by doing it via genomic selection, you're capturing a lot of other gains, and you probably make more progress in in your maternal worth, and while you're reducing your methane emissions. Next slide, please. And I just really want to show that over the years, the traits sort of fluctuate around in uh, flock 2638. And, and you can see that there's changes in adult size and, and reproduction and lamb growth and survival and meat yield um, that have been going on. Some of these have been due to the experiments that we've been conducting on the uh, flocks, for example. For example, for most of the uh, period of um, uh, the last um, 10 years, there was quite a lot of meat yield experiments uh, done on this uh, flock. Next slide, please. Can we do something else? Uh, can we do it faster and cheaper? Well, one way that we've been looking at is to take a rumen sample from these sheep, process it through, sequence it, and look at the uh, microbes in the rumen that essentially generate the methane um, <clears throat> to see if we can predict how much methane is being produced and also predict uh, the production of the animals. Next slide, please. And um, using this microbe, uh, microbiome data um, has actually been uh, quite interesting. We collect a rumen sample, we sequence about 1% of the microbial genomes and then we, we use uh, statistical methods to predict it. And uh, on the um, right-hand side, there's a bunch of traits and we can either use, um, yeah, there's something gone slightly wrong there. We can either use um, the genomic prediction, which is the blue bars, or we can use the microbial um, prediction, which is the orange bars, or we can combine them together and that's the gray bars. And uh, for the and you can see for some traits like fecal egg count, um, genomic prediction works well. Um, microbial prediction doesn't work very well at all. Um, and combining them together, it makes no benefit. But for some other traits like feed efficiency or methane, um, um, having the microbial information there makes quite a lot of difference. So so we are looking at and uh, particularly using this information 
to um, speed up and the, the accuracy of predicting for both feed efficiency and methane emissions, both uh, important maternal traits in our view. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, genomic data improves genetic progress, especially in maternal traits. It allows more accurate selection at a younger age, and it can decrease the generation length as well for some, um, in some cases. It tends to rebalance trait improvement in an index, okay, from um, more towards environmental traits and animal health traits and traits like uh, um, longevity. Um, it provides a lot of um, other opportunities for other traits to be included. Um, in our view, DNA parentage, breed composition and single gene traits come along for free under this circumstance. And, um, and our experience is, is, I think we're going to be heading towards a situation of where we want to maintain our existing genetic progress in pr productivity while we're improving environmental disease and welfare traits. But to do this, you need an organized breeding structure and you need good genetic linkages within and across breeds. Uh, final slide. I just really want to acknowledge that I'm giving this talk, but it's actually the work of the whole team here. Um, and um, um, yeah, just thank you for the opportunity to present the results and also to acknowledge all our um, um, people that support our research. Thanks very much. That's uh, great. Thank you very much, John. So we've got roughly around 20 minutes now for a question and answer session. Um, we, we'll, um, we've got plenty of questions already coming through, but please, if anybody has got questions, just type it into the question bar on the side there. But John, if that's okay, I think uh, to, to give the audience what he wants, I, I think we'll start with the questions, if that's okay with you. So we'll start with the first one, where, which has come through from uh, Ryan Murray, and, and is asking, is there any uh, specific breeds uh, uh, are producing a low methane sheep? Are they, sorry. Is there any Pacific breeds that are producing low methane sheep? Uh, there's a there's a lot of variation within each of the individual flocks that we've been looking at. the The variation seems to be about the same within the flocks, and um, there's no uh, specific breed or flock that is got markedly higher or lower. So, so it's the old adage that there's as much difference within the breeds as there is between the breeds, yes? Yes. Good. Um, the next question has come in from Kevin McDermott, and what is the estimated additional cost of the methylation test above the cost of the traditional genotyping? Uh, we're probably not there yet. Um, <clears throat> um, I, I... I could go out on a limb and say if it was done in a certain way, it'd probably be no additional cost. Um, I, I think um, right now the costs in, for the human assays and stuff like that are actually quite expensive. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you would use genomics, because if you're already genotyping the animals, you would probably select um, a group of animals to do the measurements on. Um, but long term, and I'm meaning within 10 years, 5, 10 years, uh, I would hope that it could be probably provided at minimal additional cost. Um, there's a question here from Sam, Sam Boone. Um, to reduce methane emissions, should we use CT scanning to change rumen size, or is the rumen surface area an important element? Um, the work that we have done, and I, I have to admit not published, um, uh, suggests that the rumen size is smaller in the lower methane emitting animals, um, but the the actual surface area inside the rumen is basically the same. So it, um, I've called it a, um, the rumen surface is like a shag pile carpet 
rather than Axminster. Okay, so um, that's probably, but, but it, I think that there's a bunch of things that we've got to be aware of. I think that the grazing behavior of the animals may differ. They may have, um, the lower emitters may take smaller um, feeding events and have more feeding events. So they're more like a continuous flow fermenter rather than a batch fermenter. If you're into well, bit brewing I, beer. Apologies, John, but that, that kind of leads into the next question I got, which possibly you can expand on further, when, um, which has come from, um, when measuring animals for methane production, does the grazing quality feed regime affect the methane output? That's a really good question. Um, so um, we've done some reasonably detailed work on this, and we've obviously got uh, information that we can make inferences from from the industry. Um, under a pretty broad range of environments and feeds, um, we think the percentage differences in methane emissions and between low and high emitters stay broadly the same, right? I, I, I would say that you could probably um, um, push it too far. I wouldn't like to say that if you were losing 10 or 20 percent of your body weight and you're a cow eating uh, dry uh, tropical grass uh, during the dry season, um, that everything would uh, stay together. But under, you know, under what I would call normal farming conditions, um, I think things stay pretty constant as, as far as percentage differences go. Yeah. Um, the next question is, how easy is it to take a rumen sample for a microbiome data, for microbiome data? Um, it's, um, I've, well, I've been with a couple of people, we did about uh, three or four hundred in a few hours. Um, it's, it's it's um, it's more difficult than taking a DNA sample, and and I think uh, realistically, um, in the New Zealand context, what we would be probably doing is doing it on uh, central progeny test flocks and some key um, breeder flocks, and and then using the fact that people are already um, um, uh, doing DNA genotypes on the other flocks or the rest of their animals to do the predictions. Um, there is some talk about, well, when I say talk, there's some work going on to see whether we could just take a, a, a mouth swab. Um, but at this stage of the development of the protocol, we are sticking with the rumen sample. I think there's a there's quite a bit of uh, interest in the kind of biological aging and, and that kind of uh, work. So there's a question here: Are differences in the speed of biological aging heritable, and does it relate to other genomic differences such as genetic genetic merit or poor growth rates, etc.? Uh, based on the work in humans, the answer would be yes. So, so, so that's the differences in biological aging with essentially longevity that's that's one but but the key here is is that the the um, uh, methylation profiles or epigenetic profiles can also indicate uh, how much stress and how well that animal can adapt to that stress as well and that's probably uh, one of the key things that would be used for the selection if if that this area work um, um, looks looks like it can be applied into industry. Okay. There's a good question just come up from Mary Mary Watson, um, and, and this is a reminder: if anybody's got any questions, please just type them into the uh, question section now, and we can ask John live as we go along. So here's a question for Mary: Is isn't methane emission due to the micro biome rather than the breeding. So couldn't it just be uh, changed uh, just by changing the microbiome? 
um, maybe some animals cultivate more methane efficient uh, microbiomes. Um, yeah, this is nature and nurture sort of thing. It's, we've shown very definitely that um, uh, the methane emissions from um, uh, individual sheep are heritable. Okay, so that means that the the host is controlling what, or at least can influence what microbiome is present in the rumen, and and um, um, and that uh, influ then influences how uh, how much methane is produced. So uh, methane is obviously produced by archaea, a particular type of methanogen, and they are sitting there basically looking around if there's excess hydrogen being produced from the digestion of cellulose uh, and um, by other bacteria. And um, if it is, they'll make methane. Um, so, so, so the host has control here. It's obviously the microbes that are producing the methane, right? And the microbe balance in the rumen is also influenced by the type of feed. So if you feed a lot of, say, grain or something like that, as a different type of digestion, um, and less methane is produced. Um, but there, like I said before, the ones that tend to produce high methane tend to produce high methane on uh, grain-based diets as well. So, so that in some ways goes to answer some of the question that John Martin had, which was how significant to methane emissions for an individual is feed efficiency? So that would be linked in with that, yes. Um, yeah, so feed efficiency is a, a slippery concept in, uh, 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 to me, um, because um, if an animal's rapidly growing um, young, it's a young animal and it's rapidly growing, um, um, it generally tends to be a bit leaner and it grows very fast. And so it, if it's, you effectively get a dilution of the maintenance requirement. Um, if an animal's a, an, adult, an adult ewe and it's just maintaining its weight, um, feed efficiency under those circumstances are a little different. The, the key thing here, I think, for this discussion is can we select for feed efficiency? Yes. Can we select for methane emissions? Yes. Can we combine them in an index with all the other traits? Yes. Good, thank you. Um, we've got two more questions and then we'll, we'll draw this session to an end. Um, there's a question here from Ed Brandt. Is there anything to be gained from v VFA composition when collecting microbiome samples? Uh, good question. Um, yeah, so VFA, volatile fatty acids. So basically when you digest the cellulose down, it tends to break down into these uh, volatile fatty acids, which makes up a lot of the uh, energy and um, metabolic requirements for the animal. And, and, and basically ruminants um, harvest, get their protein from the bugs, which go when, when they digest them up. Um, so there tends to be two types of um, VFAs. There's acetate and propionate. And the propionate is the good one. And the acetate one, when I say good, you can use it for more purposes. And the acetate one can only be used for um, either to keep the animal warm or to be stored as fat. Um, my feel is we did quite a lot of work with volatile fatty acids. Can we use it? Uh, can it predict methane production? The answer is yes. But volatile fatty acids fluctuate very, very quickly in the rumen um, in the order of minutes, whereas the microbes tend to be much more stable over time. They still vary, though, quite quite a lot. And, and um, we would say that um, the microbial predictors are better and probably more robust. And the truth is, is, that, is that the total cost of the assay is about the same as volatile fatty acids. 
So why why yeah. worry about it? No. Um, we've got a very good question coming here now from Stephen Johnston, and he's asking, is the heritability of methane production similar from the Cyan Dam? Um, there has been some work <laughs> Um, that hasn't been published yet, looking at uh, methane production in males and females, and also in animals um, that have been subjected to various disturbances of their um, um, uh, reproductive hormones. And the answer is, in my view, is uh, um, by and large, you can ignore it. Um, yeah, you can select in males or females, and makes a little difference in the predictive ability. Okay. Um, the last question for you, yeah, John, and th and then I'll answer a question that Heidi's uh, introduced. So this next question has come from a vet student and is asking, how exactly is the rumen sample taken? Uh, right. Uh, it's um, a, a gag is put into the mouth and uh, uh, a tube is introduced down into uh, the, the um, fore stomach of the rumen and um, using a little bit of vacuum, a sample is taken. We are, um, historically people would take a sample of about 30 mils, um, um, but we we probably are going to go ahead with only using about a mill of material. Great, great. Um, there was a question here from Heidi as well, and I'll answer that. I've uh, quickly been contacted by Sam Boone to give the answer. So so the uh, the answer is that we, we we the question was about the percentage of the UK flock that actually is performance recorded. So we record uh, around approximately 20% 20, uh, 20 of the breeding ram um, uh, terminal sires and maternal. But it, as far as the total amount of the UK flock, it would be around the one percent, um, same as um, same same as New Zealand, very much uh, something similar. So at this point, I'd like to thank John uh, for a very informative presentation. I'd like to thank all the audience; that was uh, excellent. If you have got any more questions, um, uh, please be, feel free to send them to us, and I'm sure we can forward them to John for answer. But at this point, uh, thank you very much, John, for for that session tonight or this morning, as it is in New Zealand. But it was very informative, and I'm sure the audience really did it, um, gain a lot from from that presentation, and also the presentation of on the Hill Ram scheme that Irwell and, and Janet hosted by Heather that happened earlier. Um, hopefully everybody that's joined tonight has enjoyed the session. Um, it'll be available on recording and that will be shared with you. But um, also just to highlight that we've got another three sessions left of the Sheep Breeders uh, Roundtable. Um, the next one's on tomorrow night at seven o'clock. So that's uh, Wednesday the 17th and it's on terminal sire breeding, a new way to sell stock. And that's going to be hosted by our colleagues up in Scotland from QMS. And then on Thursday night, um, we've got a, a, a presentation uh, on future proofing your sheep business, and that's from Ag Research. And then finally, to draw this year's sheep breeders, this this year's online sheep breeders uh, roundtable to a close, there'll be a present um, a, a session hosted by NSA on breeding sheep for the future. Um, all that's left for me to say is to thank all our speakers tonight: um, John uh, McEwen, Heather um, Heather McCallman. Um, Janet Roden and also uh, Irwell Jones. Um, also thank the audience for, for listening in. Also need to thank those that were, have been busily working in the background. Carry on from AHDB and Lori from HCC. Uh, without those, it would be very difficult to host these kind of events. So thank you all for joining. Hopefully you enjoyed and um, we'll hope to see you all tomorrow night again. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you.